Jacob says, Mahanaim, this is God's camp. No matter what I'm facing, no matter what fears are ahead, no matter what I just went through behind, no matter what war ahead or war behind, I'm right here and the Lord is with me, ready to encourage me. And it's the same for you and I even today. Verse 3. Then Jacob sent messengers before him uh, to Esau, his brother, in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. And he commanded them, saying, Speak thus to my lord Esau. Thus your servant Jacob says, I have dwelt with Laban and stayed there until now. I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, and male and female servants, and I have sent to tell my Lord that I may find favor in your sight. God has an interesting way of not letting us out of things. I mean, 20 years previously, Jacob had run from Esau because Esau wanted to kill him, and now God is bringing him back to face his brother in this situation. When he had left, his mom had said to him, hey, when Esau cools off, I'll send word for you and you can come back. Well, he hadn't heard anything in 20 years and so he's rightly thinking he still wants to kill me, even after all this time. And so Jacob sends kind of this messenger of this request of peace out to his brother. He's passing through that area, trying to kind of get an idea of what he's going to be dealing with. And notice these things about this. Number one, he takes a, quite a humble road. He says in verse 4, he says, calls himself his servant. I am your servant, Jacob. He calls Esau in verse 5, uh, my Lord. Tell my Lord. And it's a very humble road he's, he's putting forth. Number two, it shows that he hasn't been out causing trouble. He says there that I have dwelt with Laban and stayed there until now. I'm not even in the land of Canaan as a threat. I, I've been settled down with Uncle Laban for the past 20 years. Number three, he speaks of blessings in verse five. I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, and male and female servants. He hasn't come to rip them off. He didn't, he's not there to steal from them again like he had previously. He's got plenty. And number four, probably most importantly, he says at the end of verse five, he states his desire that I have sent to tell my Lord that I may find favor in your sight. In the King James, it's grace. That I may have grace in your sight. You see, for Jacob, he understood and he finally knew that the sin that he had done, the hurt that he had caused his brother, even after 20 years, the pain that he had experienced, and now he's just simply asking for grace. He's asking for grace. Are you a vessel of grace? Are you one that extends grace when there's been incredible amounts of pain and hurt and sin that's been done? It can be an incredibly hard thing to do. But it reminds us of the fact that we need to be agents of grace, vessels of mercy, because God has been gracious to us. God has been gracious to us. We were the offenders to him. And he has been gracious to us. Listen to what the Bible says in Ephesians 4. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. What a measure. And we say, Lord, I can't. The, the pain still hurts. The, the wound is pretty fresh and still open. Even after 20 years, the Lord would say, listen, let me take care of that. You step out and trust me and you extend the grace where the pain is and watch me heal. Watch me go before you and work it because I can do that. And so verse six, it says there, then the messengers returned to Jacob saying, we came to your brother Esau and he also is coming to meet you, and 400 men are with him. So Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, and he divided the people that were with him and the flocks and herds and camels into two companies. And he said, if Esau comes to the one company and attacks it, then the other company which is left will escape. He asked for grace. He's seeking peace, and in return he gets word that Esau is coming out to him with 400 men. What would you think? Exactly what Jacob thinks. He's coming to kill me. He's coming to kill me. And from Esau's point of view, he simply is, he's cooled off, but he has no idea what Jacob's about. And so he's going out to meet him as well. But notice what happens in Jacob's heart. He goes from this peace to a panic. 
as he sees these circumstances changing. Verse 6 tells us, so Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. And in the Jesse Clay Camp version, it's simply he was freaked out. He is freaked out because that's what happens to us. We're there going, wow, Lord, this is God's camp. I'm so blessed with who you are, Lord. Oh, just help me to trust in you. Ah, what's in front of me? And we freak out as we walk out these doors. Oh, yeah, there are the bills. Oh, yeah, there's the issue. Oh, yeah, I knew I needed to do something yesterday. Oops. And uh, it just bears down heavy upon you, and we begin to panic, just like Jacob's doing here. And what does he do? He, he separates his, his, his um, family. He separates things apart. He's, he's kind of dividing things out, as the caravans would do in that day when the enemy attacks. And we lose sight of the, the peace, and we lose sight of the things that God showed us, even a couple verses earlier. It reminds me of somewhat exactly what happens with Peter. Lord, command me to come out on the water. I want to be with you, Lord. I want to do the miraculous. I want to be right there. This is so good, Lord. Sweet. This is good stuff. And we look over and see the wave and, ha, Lord, I'm sinking. Yet look at what he does when he's sinking. It's a good move. He begins to pray. Verse 9. Then Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, the Lord who said to me, return to your country and to your family and I will deal well with you. I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which you have shown your servant. For I crossed over this Jordan with my staff and now I have become two companies. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother and from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he come and attack me and the mother with the children. For you said, you, I will surely treat you well and make your descendants as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. He turns to the Lord in his prayer. And notice something about his prayer. It's full of the promptings and the promises of God. He says it right right from the beginning. He says, Lord, you were the one that prompted me and told me to return to the land of my fathers. Lord, you put this in my heart. You directed me, and you knew I would face this circumstance. And he closes it out with, Lord, you're the one that promised me that you would make my descendants as the multitude as the stars and such, and that you would bring me back to this land, that you would bless me. In the middle of it, I'm right here facing this battle. And it's difficult. It's hard. It's the things that sometimes we find ourselves in the exact same place. Lord, what, what's going on? Notice what he says there. <coughs> And I think we can learn a few lessons from these aspects of prayer when you're facing difficult times. Number one, when you're faced with fears and you're, you're wondering, Lord, what do I do? The first thing is to fall back on what you know to be true about God. Fall back on what you know to be true. When you can't see what's going on ahead, you don't know what circumstances are going to bring tomorrow, fall back on what you know to be true about God. That his promises, his word, his truths are all there, ready for you. But realize this, that when God is leading your life, it's not always a smooth road. And, and many of you that have walked with God for a long time, you know that when God leads you, sometimes it's through the valley of the shadow of death. It doesn't change who he is. It doesn't change his goal and intentions. It's just part of the process. And when you're facing those times of the valley of the shadow of death, much like Jacob, there's always the enemy there that whispers in your ear, you can't trust God. What kind of God is this who allows these things? A God of love? (laughs) What? And he's whispering there that you ultimately would turn your back and trust in God and say, God doesn't know best, I do. But we learn this lesson from Jacob when he's facing the fears. He falls back on what he knows to be true, what God has spoken to him and what the word of God has spoken to his heart that seems to be the right route to go. As you persist in prayer, your faith will get stronger. Jesus said there as he, in the garden in Matthew 26, he told the disciples, watch and pray. The spirit is willing, but what? The flesh is weak. The flesh wants to run, but it's the spirit that has to rise up and say, Lord, you've brought me this far. You will not let me down. The second thing you might note, and we learn from this, is that when facing the fears, pray the promises of God. 
Pray the promises of God. It's, notice what, exactly what Jacob did in verse 9. He says, Lord, the Lord who said to me. In verse 12, he says the same thing. You said, Lord, this was your idea. You said in your word these things, and that's where I want to stand. I know I'm not worthy of it, and you are an incredible, merciful God. I mean, I've got nothing, and you've blessed me with what I have, and so, Lord, I'm, I'm going to trust you, but your promises will stand. And it's been said that there's somewhere between 3,000 and 5,000 promises of God in the, word of, in, in the Bible. Each one of those is enough for us to stand on our ground and say, Lord, you said And so when you're facing those fears, you need to go back and you need to get the promises of God in you so that you can pray them out of you. You need to know the word of God. Lord, I don't know what to do, but you know, you told me that if I ask anything in your name, that you hear my request and and I can have uh, peace with that. I know, Lord, that your plans for me are not good, I mean are good and not evil to give me a future and a hope. I, I know, Lord, that your promises are true. They're yes and Amen. And I know, Lord, that you give a peace that passes understanding. And so I'm standing on those things because I don't know what's out there. The third lesson we can learn from him when facing our fears is pretty simple. is just to be honest with God. That's what Jacob did. Look at verse 11. He simply told the Lord, I fear him. Speaking of Esau. Lord, I'm just outright scared to death. I'm afraid. And in your prayers, you don't have to schmooze over God and have, you know, God, I'm really happy. Listen, I know I'm scared to death inside, but I can't tell God how I really feel because somehow he's not going to work with me. No, 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 he already knows. And there's nothing wrong with going before the Lord and say, God, I am just freaked out. Let me be real with you, Lord. I'm just freaked out. And I think the Lord would say, yeah, I know. And I'm right here with you. I'm here in your prayer. We're going to walk through this together. It's not over. Verse 13. So he lodged there that same night and he took what came to his hand as a present for Esau, his brother. 200 female goats and 20 male goats, 200 ewes and 20 rams, 30 milk camels with their colts, 40 cows and 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys and 10 foals. Then he delivered them to the hand of his servants, every drove by itself and said to his servants, Pass over before me and put some distance between successive droves. And he commanded the first one, saying, When Esau, my brother, meets you and asks you, saying, To whom do you belong? And where are you going? Whose are these in front of you? Then you shall say, They are your servant, Jacob's. It is a present sent to my lord Esau, and behold, he also is behind us. So he commanded the second, the third, and all who followed the droves, saying, In this manner you shall speak to Esau when you find him. And also say, Behold, your servant Jacob is behind us. For he said, I will appease him with the present that goes before me. And afterward I will see his face. Perhaps he will accept me. So the present went on over before him. But he himself lodged that night in the camp. There's a pattern taking place here. First Joseph requested this peace. Requested peace. And then he reacts in a panic. Upon the news, his brother is coming out to him. And then he resorted to prayer, which was the right move. But now, now he goes back to his own planning. How am I going to appease my brother, his rage? How am I going to work the angle? It's really signs of a man that isn't totally broken before God. Maybe you've seen it in your own life. And then the amen happens, you take the burden right back up. You know, and there's a point at which in our brokenness that we say, God, I'm going to stand on your promises and I take all my plans and just lay them at your feet. I don't know what to do, Lord, but I'm asking you to go before me and deal with these things. But Jacob takes up a plan and it's quite an interesting plan. It's quite creative. He sends at least four companies of gifts. They're spaced apart to Esau, his brother, to kind of appease him. And he says, make sure you tell him this. This is a present for you. And Jacob is behind you. He's trying to really smooth over his brother. But it tells us a few things about Jacob's scenario here. Number one, it shows us the incredible wealth of Jacob. Think about this. This is all excess that he's given. 440 goats, sheep, and ram. 
30 camels with their young, 40 cows, 10 bulls, 20 donkeys, and a partridge in a pear tree. I mean, this is like Christmas four times over. And this is excess. He came out of this land with nothing but a staff in his hand. Now he's returning and he's got so much the Lord has blessed him with that he's, this is the excess he's giving his brother. Incredible, the work of God. Second, it shows us that Jacob's not coming to fight, but he's coming to bless. Esau, I'm not trying to pick a fight with you. I, I want to bless you. But third, and probably most importantly, it shows us the incredible measure that Jacob's willing to go to establish peace with his brother. A sacrifice. A sacrifice is being made. His fears were definitely serious, and he makes a sacrifice. And the question that you and I really face in this is, what is the price that I'm willing to pay for peace? Peace of mind, peace with my brother that I've offended. What am I willing to, in a sense, pay for the peace? Because we, require, we realize that peace requires a sacrifice. There's a dying that must take place for peace to be restored. It oftentimes is a dying to myself. It's a sacrifice of myself and my rights and my will and all that in order to see that, hey, peace needs to rule. It needs to rule. And why do we do things like that? Why do we choose the lower path to humble ourselves and to seek peace? Because that's exactly what the Father did to us when he sent his son, Jesus Christ. We were the ones who offended him. And we were underneath the wrath of God, as the Bible tells us. But God demonstrates his own love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That we might have peace with God. You see, God's not interested in your gift. What can I give God that I may appease him? Oh, that I, you know, if I just give more, if I walk old ladies across the street, if I help out this guy over here, if I do these things, oh, then God will finally, I'll win his grace. No. The price has already been paid. The sacrifice has already been made for your peace. It's a matter of you and I receiving it and walking in it. Listen to what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and to those who were near. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. You see, here's the reality of things. God says, I want to give you peace. Peace with me first. So that then you can go out and make peace with others. And the reality is this, that when you extend peace to others, when you take the lower road, you realize you are imitating to others the very nature of and heart of God. Matthew chapter 5 tells us, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called what? The sons of God. The Lord says, hey, I really want to reach this guy. I know he's a sinner and I know he's blown it big time and guess what? He's hurt you in the process so guess what I want you to do? I want you to be my peacemaker. Oh Lord, not me. Get somebody else. Get the other guy down the road. That guy's offended me too much. I want you to be my peacemaker we die to ourselves, and we go down that road and we realize that Lord you've made peace with me and I want to make peace with others even though Jacob sent the gifts he still was troubled inside he still thought well what if the gifts don't work and he's going to face an incredible sleepless night as he wrestles I'm going to save that for next week because first service i fell apart coughing (laughs) and had to stop and I don't want to get too far ahead. But I think about this and some of these things that we talked about. Number one, is there an issue that you need to make peace with? It might be 20 years. But the Lord's not finished and he's brought you back around. Number two, your approach to it. How are you going to approach it? Approach it in humility. Not with your own plans, but with God's. And know that God wants to give you a fresh start. 
Number three, you need to understand that the Lord is with you wherever you go. That he's there to minister to you. No matter what you're gonna face when you walk out these doors in the coming new year, no matter what the past year has faced, God will be faithful to you and he'll be there every step of the way. Trust in him. He understands you're gonna have times where you panic. It's the natural part within us. But as you turn from the panic, turn to prayer. Not to your own planning, but turn to prayer. And hear from God, Lord, give me your peace inside. And let that rule my heart and my mind. Because I just don't have a clue what's coming around the corner. Maybe there's a fight that you've got to somehow, you know, kind of settle down. And you need the wisdom. James tells us the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable. Willing to yield full of mercy and good fruits.